GraphQL, a query language for APIs. You define a schema for your data, then tell GraphQL how to fetch and supply that schema. And in doing so, amazing things might happen, as we'll see in this video. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. In today's video, you'll learn the fundamental concepts of GraphQL by interacting with the public SpaceX API. If you're new here, like and subscribe, and I'd like to give a special thanks to Arjun Yellamanchelli, who is the mastermind behind this video. If you're looking for a GraphQL expert, you can find his LinkedIn and GitHub in the description below. Let's start by answering the question of what is GraphQL? In the most basic sense, it's a language that allows your front-end applications to communicate with your back-end applications. A Rosetta Stone, if you will. A consistent way for your front-end to request data from your back-end despite any differences in the underlying programming language. For example, your mobile application might need to request a sandwich from your API. It can make that request by sending a GraphQL query. The query will have the same shape that you expect to receive back from the API as JSON. So in this case, we expect a sandwich object with bread, ham, and cheese. On the server, GraphQL also functions as a runtime for executing queries. The server defines types for the data that's available there, and also resolvers to actually fetch the data from a database or some other data source. Now, because everything on the server is strongly typed, we can get some really amazing tooling with GraphQL. To demonstrate this, let's head over to the GraphQL Explorer for the public SpaceX API. If you're the consumer or using the API in your front-end application, you can do introspection to the back-end to see what data is available there. As you can see here, we have a whole bunch of different checkboxes that represent different queries we can make to the SpaceX API. In the middle panel, we already have an example GraphQL query ready to go. Now go ahead and hit the play button to execute the query, and then you'll see on the right side we get a JSON payload returned from the server. And what you'll notice is that the properties on this JSON object are identical to the way we structured them in our GraphQL query. And on top of that, everything is strongly typed. If we hover over a field in our GraphQL query, you can see that it gives us a type. There are several built-in types like string, integer, etc. And the server can also define its own custom types. So when working with GraphQL as a front-end developer, you'll always know the exact shape of the data that you're expecting back from the server. And speaking of that, let's take a second to look at the differences between REST APIs and GraphQL APIs. REST stands for Representational State Transfer, and it's the status quo for API design that we've been following for the last 20 years. Now let's say our front-end application wants to make a sandwich. In REST, we might make three different requests, one for bread, ham, and cheese. Each request is mapped to its own unique URL, and each response from the server would contain the full JSON payload with everything that we need, like the full loaf of bread, a full pig, and a full wedge of cheese. Even though our front-end application doesn't necessarily need all that data, we can just filter it out in the front-end code. Now, in GraphQL world, things are quite a bit different. Instead of having multiple URL endpoints, we just have a single entry point into the API. So it's the actual query sent from the front-end that determines what the back-end will return. It's not based on a URL or any specific mapping like that. In addition, the GraphQL API will only return the actual fields that were requested. Instead of requesting ingredients one by one, we just get the full sandwich all put together. Now, let's say we also want to add a side salad and a drink to this query. In GraphQL, it's a simple matter of updating the query, but in REST, we would likely have to make at least two more requests to two different unique URLs to get this data. The beauty of GraphQL is that it simplifies the way you request data from your front-end code. So obviously GraphQL is way better than REST and you should never use REST ever again, right? Well, it's really not that simple. While GraphQL provides a lot of advantages, there are some disadvantages as well. The biggest disadvantage in my opinion is that there is some added complexity up front. You can build a RESTful service with Express.js with like five lines of code, but with GraphQL, you have some additional dependencies, a type system, and the benefits might not be that substantial if you're a small team or have a relatively simple API. The benefits of GraphQL really kick in when you have multiple developers working with a large API that needs to map together a whole bunch of different backend data sources. In any case, GraphQL is very fun to work with as a developer, so let's go ahead and play around with some queries to SpaceX. Let's go ahead and delete the default, and then we'll make a query for all of the rockets in SpaceX. Click the box for rockets, and then if you hover over rockets, you'll notice that it returns a query of an array of rockets. A rocket is a custom type defined by the server, and if we click on it, we can see all the different data properties available there. And then we can simply click the checkboxes for the properties that we want returned from this query. And what you'll also notice is that queries can take arguments. In this case, we can set a limit to a specific number of rockets, or we can offset it if we're doing pagination. So now that we have a list of rockets, let's go ahead and copy one of the IDs and make a request for an individual rocket. 
Go ahead and click the rocket box, and you'll notice this query takes an ID as its argument. Then simply select the properties that you want to read on the rocket object. And that's really all there is to it when it comes to fetching data from a GraphQL API. But there are a couple more advanced things that you should know about. You can reuse values throughout your queries by using variables, which you'll see prefixed with a dollar sign. But sometimes you might actually want to change the query entirely based on the value of a variable. For example, you can see we have this gluten-free variable, so we might not want to include bread if that option is set to true. So if the gluten-free boolean is true, then it will include bread on this order. But that's not exactly right, so let's go ahead and do the exact opposite with the skip directive to exclude bread if it's set to true. And it's also possible that your GraphQL schema has a certain property that returns multiple types or a union type. For example, our sandwich might come with a side, and that side might either be french fries or a salad. If it's a salad, then we might want to return the dressing field, and if it's french fries, then we might want to return the side field. So as a front-end developer, GraphQL gives you a lot of flexibility for structuring your queries, and then it's up to your back-end developers to write the code to resolve the queries, which tends to be the more difficult part. In addition to reading data by making queries, you might also want to write data or modify data on the server by using a mutation. A mutation works just like a query, but it's a convention that signals that some data will be modified on the server. So now that you know the basics of GraphQL, I want to show you how to put it to use in an actual real-world front-end application. The most popular way to work with GraphQL from a front-end application is to use the Apollo client. It's essentially a state management library that allows you to write GraphQL queries, then see the results automatically updated in your UI. Apollo has integrations for all the major JavaScript frameworks like Angular, React, Vue, etc., including vanilla web components and also native platforms like iOS and Android. What I want to show you over the next few minutes is a practical example combining Apollo, GraphQL, and Angular. Our goal is to create a simple web app that will fetch the recent launches from SpaceX. Then when we click on a specific launch, it will take us to the details for that launch along with some pictures. Now, as I mentioned earlier, one of the big advantages of GraphQL is the awesome tooling that it provides. And when combined with TypeScript, it gets even better. You'll also learn how to convert your GraphQL API into a series of interfaces that you can use directly in your front-end application. So when you combine Angular with GraphQL, you get end-to-end -end type safety, providing an amazing developer experience. You can see here I'm in a brand new Angular app, and the first thing I want to do is install the Apollo GraphQL extension for VS Code. It provides syntax highlighting and everything else you need to work with GraphQL in VS Code. From there, we'll go to the root of the project and create a new file called apolloconfig.js. This will tell Apollo where to find our backend API, which in this case should point to the public SpaceX API. The next step is to generate a couple of components that we can use for the screens in this app. We have a list view that will show all the recent launches from SpaceX, and then also a detail view. We can generate these components with the Angular CLI, and we'll also set the change detection to on push, which is just a little performance optimization that we can use here, because with Apollo and GraphQL, the only thing that we actually need to do is subscribe to observables for our data. So we don't need to use Angular's built-in change detection. The next thing we'll do is jump into the app routing module and set up routes for these actual components. We'll set the root route to our launch list component. That's the default route the user lands on. Then if they click on one of the launch cards, it will take them to a URL parameter with that ID, then show additional details about that specific launch. That takes care of our routing configuration. Now let's go into the app component and delete all of the boilerplate code that comes with the default Angular app. Just make sure to leave the router outlet. And now we're ready to write our first GraphQL query. And the reason I want to do this first is because as you'll see in a minute here, we can use the query to automatically generate Angular services, interfaces, and basically everything else we need to work with our backend data. Go into the launch list component and create a new file called launchlist.graphql. Now, unlike the interactive editor, we'll start out our query by writing the query keyword, and then we can give that a name called past launches list. And we'll have it take a parameter called limit, which will take an integer argument and the exclamation mark after the type makes it required. Then inside the query, we'll write some GraphQL code, just like we did earlier in the video. We'll make a reference to the launches past query that's provided by SpaceX, and then we'll pass in our limit argument. From there, we'll add the actual fields that we want for each individual launch object, like the ID, mission name, links to some images, and so on. So this defines all the data that we want to show in our launch list component. And now we'll move over to our launch details component and do the same thing by creating a launch details GraphQL file. One thing you'll notice on this query is that we have a required type of ID. The ID type works just like a string, except that it signals that it's a unique value. 
Then we can pass that ID to the launch query in GraphQL and then filter by the fields that we actually want from the API. So now that we have our GraphQL queries in place, we can generate a whole bunch of code automatically. The first thing we'll need to do is integrate Apollo into this project. So head over to the command line and run ng-add Apollo Angular. This command will install our Apollo dependencies and also create a GraphQL module in the app directory. Go ahead and open up that file and tell it where to find the GraphQL API by modifying this URI variable. So that takes care of the setup for Apollo, but we want to generate a lot of our code automatically as opposed to writing it manually. The tool that can help us do that is the GraphQL code generator. This is a really awesome tool that you can use on both the back end and front end to look at your GraphQL schema and then automatically generate TypeScript interfaces and in our case, Angular services that can fetch the data from the back end. We have this big long install command and you can copy and paste that from the lesson repo. Once those are installed, we'll create a code gen YAML file in the root of the project. This simply tells the code generator where to find our GraphQL files and what to generate once it finds them. And now that we have that configuration in place, we just need a command to run that will actually run the generator. We can do that by going into the package JSON and going into the scripts. We'll create a new command called codegen that runs the generator. Then we can open up the terminal and run that command, and you'll see it generates a new directory called services with a service that we can use to fetch data from the GraphQL API. Now the cool thing about the code generator is that it looked at the actual schema of the SpaceX API and also our local GraphQL queries and combined the two together. So we now have an Angular service that has all of the interfaces from the SpaceX API and also methods to fetch the data that we actually want based on our own local GraphQL queries. That was quite a bit of configuration to get started, but now that we have that done, we really only have to focus on writing components and writing GraphQL queries. Now let's go ahead and finish things up by writing the components for the user interface. To make things look nice, I'll go ahead and add Angular Material to this project by running ng-add at Angular Material. And then in the app component, I'll import the material card module. From there, I'm going to head over to the launch list component TypeScript. And the first thing I'll do is inject the pass launches service in the constructor. Remember, this service was automatically generated by the code generator. The service is able to fetch the pass launches from SpaceX by using the fetch method, and then we can pass in the limit argument and set it to 30. The response is going to have some additional data that we don't really need, so what we'll do is pipe in the map operator, and then we'll just map the response down to the actual data that we want to show in the UI, which in this case will be the response data launches passed. Now if we go into the template, we can unwrap the pass launches observable by using the async pipe. And then we'll set the result as a template variable called past launches. The past launches will be an array of launch objects, so we can simply loop over them using the ng4 directive in Angular. That will give us a material card for each individual launch, and then we can add a router link that will point to that specific launch ID. So when the user clicks on a card, it will route them to the launch details component. And then everything after that is pretty standard Angular templating. We'll display a material card header with an image and then a title and a subtitle. At this point, you should be able to run ng-serve from the terminal and then open up localhost 4200 and see a list of launches from the SpaceX API. Now at this point, when you click on an actual item, it will take you to the launch details component, but we haven't actually built that one out yet. So let's go ahead and do that now. Go ahead and open up the launch details component TypeScript and then we'll import activated route from Angular Router and also our launch details GraphQL service. And then we'll go ahead and inject those in the constructor. The reason we need activated route is because our GraphQL query takes an ID as its argument, and we get that ID from the URL in the browser. Angular provides all of the URL parameters as an observable, which we can access on the activated route param map. When we have that observable, we want to switch to an observable of the actual data from GraphQL. That's a perfect use case for the RxJS switch map operator. In other words, once we have the ID parameter from the URL, we'll go ahead and switch to another observable, which in this case is the launch detail service fetch of that specific ID. And then like we did in the previous example, we'll go ahead and map the response down just to the raw data because we don't need any of the additional metadata that comes back with the response. And then also like we did in the previous example, we'll unwrap the observable at the top of the file by using the async pipe, and then we'll set a template variable as launch details. Then from there, we simply add some HTML for the UI and interpolate the values that we want to show to the user. And keep in mind, I am using a few custom CSS styles here. You can find those in the full lesson repo.
Then if we go back to our app, you'll notice that when we click on a launch, it will show the actual launch details and some additional photos in the detail page. Congratulations, you now have a full stack Apollo GraphQL powered Angular app. Now, if you want some extra credit, I'd recommend going to the full lesson repo, give it a star, and check out the extra credit section at the very end. It'll show you how to build an Angular pipe that will format the actual dates of the launches in relative time. For example, it will say a launch occurred 10 seconds ago, yesterday, five days ago, and so on. I'm gonna go ahead and wrap things up there. If this video helped you, please like and subscribe and consider becoming a pro member at Fireship.io to get access to even more content. Thanks for watching and I will talk to you soon. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff, we have a liftoff.